we had a bunch of students from Sheffield University, they were journalism students, came into The Guardian uh, last week, uh, and the question one of them asked me was, uh, I, what, what is the point of journalism? Um, uh, well, it's a good question if you're thinking of going into journalism. Um, uh, and she said, because it doesn't change anything. And uh, I took a deep breath, and uh, I said to her that the longer I had done this job, uh, the more I thought that journalism was all we have, uh, which is a slight journalist exaggeration, but uh, it is what I feel, um, uh, and particularly investigative journalism, uh, journalism that is in intensive and inquiring and never flagging and uh, about things that really matter. Uh, and that kind of journalism does change the world, uh, and increasingly the absence of that kind of journalism uh, changes the world uh, in a different kind of way. Uh, so that's what we're about to celebrate, uh, and we're about to hear about four journalists whose work really has changed the world. Um, so uh, the index of, uh, on censorship, Freedom of Expression Award for Journalism is sponsored by The Guardian. And it recognizes impactful, original, and unwavering investigative journalism across all media. Um, I'm going to give you the 2015 shortlist. Uh, Lirio Abate from Italy. Safa Ahmad from Saudi Arabia. Rafael Marquez de Moraes from Angola. And Eko Moscovy from Russia. Journalism. Lirio Abate, Italy. Lirio Abate is a Sicilian journalist specializing in investigating the criminal activity and political connections of the modern Italian Mafia. Abate's work has exposed the corrupt awarding of public contracts and the collusion of public figures alongside drug and people trafficking. Abate is subject to regular violent threats, from receiving bullets with his name on to finding a bomb placed under his car in 2008. So that he can continue his work where many others have been silenced, Abate now travels in an armored vehicle with 24-hour constant police protection. When you read Lirio Abate's biography, you feel this feeling of humility, you know, because you start realizing how much it takes for someone to bring truth out, to bring justice out, and to also break the silence that, you know, the cartel feeds on. So he's a hero, like the typical hero. <laughs> Safa Al Ahmad, Saudi Arabia. Safa Al Ahmad has spent the last three years taking enormous personal risks covertly filming an unreported mass uprising in Saudi Arabia's oil-rich, yet extremely poor, Shiite eastern province. Al-Ahmad's 30-minute documentary, Saudi's Secret Uprising, was broadcast by the BBC in May 2014. It broke the media blackout and drew international attention to previously unreported violent and bloody protests. All throughout the Middle East we see the rise of patriarchy and the male-dominated culture, but I think Saudi Arabia in particular is one of the places where it's much more difficult to be a woman. So her courage, the way she dared to go into places that were difficult on her own, with her camera, to bring that information back and share it with the world, I have so much respect for what she has achieved. Rafael Marques de Moraes, Angola. Rafael Marques de Moraes is an Angolan journalist and human rights activist who runs the anti-corruption news site MacaAngola.org. Despite being one of the world's richest countries in terms of natural resources, 70% of Angola's population lives on less than $2 a day. Marques is deeply committed to holding politicians accountable for this, tirelessly reporting on embezzlement and corruption. He has been repeatedly imprisoned and threatened, including at one point a 40-day detention without charge, during which time he was denied food and water for days. Raphael is an incredible individual who has been bringing something to the attention of people, for which he's paid heavy prices currently facing criminal proceedings. So this is a very important individual doing very important work in a very, very difficult environment. Echo Moskvi, Russia. Echo Moskvi is an independent Russian radio station, revered by many as the last bastion of free speech in Russia. With an estimated audience of 7 million, 
ECHO is openly critical of all sides, including Vladimir Putin's regime. 2014 has been one of the most turbulent in ECHO's 24-year history, with its website banned, the Dagestan branch of the station closed down and the station coming under pressure over its continued reporting on the Ukrainian conflict. Echo Moskvi is one of the few remaining independent media outlets in Russia and reminds us of the importance of fighting for free information and for a free media in the former Soviet Union. And the uh, winner is, in fact, this year it was very, very difficult for the jury to, uh, to make a decision. And we were equally impressed by uh, two of our nominees. So the award is being given jointly to both. Uh, Safa Al Ahmad. Where is she? Is she there? <laughs> And our, our second co-winner is Raphael from Angola. I just prepared that speech in case. <laughs> it's always good to be prepared. Uh, dear Jody Ginsberg, Director of Index on Censorship, honorable members of the jury, distinguished guests, my fellow co-winners, ladies and gentlemen, with an award comes a greater responsibility. It is therefore my privilege to accept this journalism award and dedicate it to my fellow Ethiopian colleagues, Eskinder Nega, Rio Talemo, and the Zone 9 bloggers. They are in jail. <laughs> currently serving some of the harshest sentences in Africa for the crime of exercising their right to freedom of expression. For over a year, the Ethiopian government has denied to provide adequate health care for Riot Alemo, who is in desperate need. Ethiopia is the seat of the African Union, and its regime is one of the worst offenders for upholding the freedoms of the press and of expression. When a regime in Africa succeeds in trampling their citizens' rights with impunity, and enjoy such a good international standing and legitimacy as Ethiopia, it becomes a textbook case for other authoritarian regimes. I believe in the power of solidarity. I have experienced troubles of my own. It has been the solidarity of others that has helped to strengthen my courage and resolve to continue my journey. Back in 96, being in London and aghast at press censorship in Angola, I decided to bring it to international attention. Because I could not speak English, you won't believe this, I fumbled through an organization's directory and found the index on censorship. I could understand the word censorship. I called them and attended a meeting on Africa, which was just taking place on the same day. 
and my remarks that day were most convincing and incredibly short. Censorship in Angola, bad. <laughs> Dushantos, the president, bad, very bad. <laughs> then a few months later, I had an, art an article translated and published in the Index magazine. It was disseminated through other publications in a number of countries. <clears throat> On my return to Angola from this trip, I will be sitting in court on March 24 as the defendant on nine separate charges of criminal defamation brought against me by seven powerful generals and four of their business associates. I wrote a book that exposed human rights abuses in the diamond industry, in which the plaintiffs are major shareholders and whose private security company has executed many of the violations. I can't say enough that I'm proud and honored to stand up against such a mighty power to enable many of the victims to speak out through my reports, which I have been producing for the past 10 years. I will come out of this trial stronger and empowered by the experience. Thank you very much for this wonderful occasion. Thank you. He already forgot about his award. I met awe of people like Raphael who can, uh, who can do such a courageous reporting and still live in the country. I think that's, uh, I'm very jealous. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, in Saudi Arabia, it's not the case. Um, Saudi Arabia is a mystery, uh, even to its own people. Parts of our history are deliberately concealed, the present muddle muddled, and with rumors and half-truths. The government-owned and controlled media play a major role in the dissemination of those false realities of ourselves and others. This makes facts a precious commodity in Saudi Arabia. The uprising in the east of Saudi Arabia, which is the topic of the film, is a perfect example of how well the government has succeeded in controlling the story and the narrative around an unprecedented event in modern Saudi history. And it also exposes the failure of media and not cutting through the government narrative and propaganda. Since the protests started in Qatif in early 2011, along with all the other Arab Spring protests in the Arab world, youth were arrested and given death sentences for simply posting on Facebook, like Ali and Nimr. Poets like Adil al -Abbad and human rights activist Fadl Manasif were given 15-year sentences for threatening social stability. So-called anti-terrorism laws were introduced to criminalize most forms of dissent. For this film that I made and the stories I told and the opinions I shared, I have been called and accused of lying and spying, advocating terrorism, aiding and abetting terrorists, and of course, I have been called a heretic, the worst of all in the Middle East. As a journalist in the Middle East, people think they have the right to constantly ask you what religion or sect you belong to and judge your work accordingly. It has become nearly impossible to do a story without talking about Sunnis and Shia. But sectarianism is used as a tool, as a weapon, to further confuse and tangle an already complicated political landscape. It has become acceptable, reductive language in the media, both Arab and Western, to explain our world. In Saudi Arabia, it is used to isolate and crush a fledgling uprising, a clever way to stop the rest of the country from joining those who have the same demands, to stop political oppression, freedom for all political prisoners, for a transparent and just political system, to stop corruption, and most importantly, equal rights for all citizens. But in the end, the uprising became reduced to a story of Shia minority protesting the majority Sunni rulers. A true statement in face value, but not the whole complicated and very messy truth. Uh, I had a lot of extreme reactions to the film. Uh, some people liked it, some people really hated it. Uh, but in the end, I hope I helped to shed some light on what was happening in Saudi Arabia. Thank you. Thank you.